What about uh, what about Maurice Broadus? Is he one of your favorites? Oh, that guy's a hack. <laughs> I'm just gonna go. Oh, he's wonderful. <laughs> Can you give, like, give me some warning when you're gonna stick me on the air or something? I'm like, send her money. Hey, Colin, yeah, I, I, what about Colin? But I'm transitioning. This is not. Yeah, sorry. I, wish I knew. You should have gave me a warning. No, uh, Harrow County is amazing, and uh, actually, Colin very nicely sent me uh, the tooth, which I thought was hilarious and fun. Well, thank you. <laughs> oh, Rachel, All right, Paul Tremblay. Really, really appreciate uh, your generosity. Uh, again, folks, for the next half hour, Paul is going to match your donations. Uh, so text VCARE to 91999 or go to scaresthecareweekend.com and click donate. Paul Tremblay, we appreciate it, my friend. Have a good time, comics people. <laughs> All right. Right now, uh, as you can see, we've got Rachel Autumn Deering, Jamal Eigel, Colin Bunn, my friend Maurice Broadus. <laughs> and of course, Matt Wilson. Uh, we are missing Tim Seeley, so I'm going to go track him down. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to y'all. Y'all are going to talk uh, for a little bit about your favorite horror comics. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> <right. laughs> Somebody go first. <laughs> well, I guess I guess technically I'm supposed to be moderating. So, <laughs> okay. good job, man. Good job. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, well, hey, you know, nice meeting all of you and getting to talk to you for the first time. Uh, Hi, Matt. <laughs> never, never got the chance to do this. It's not. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I am uh, Matt Wilderson. I do all the editing for the uh, for. Her like the horror show of Brian Keene, Cosmic Shenanigans, you know, the whole network there, Defenders Dialogue. I can't forget that or Christopher Golden will probably hate me for the rest of my life. But yes, I, I do the editing for that. And also my uh, podcast, Grindcast. I'm in the east wing of the Grindcast uh, studio, which is the size of a walk-in closet. And uh, yeah, and I'm also a horror writer. So and enough about me, though. People were probably more interested in you guys. So we'll start with you, Maurice. Hi, uh, my name is Maurice Broadus. I'm a horror, science fiction, fantasy author. I have a, a dozen books out, about a hundred short stories. Um, I do some game writing, and uh, I'm excited to have this conversation. Awesome. Uh, how about you, Colin? Uh, my name is Colin Bunn. I am a, mostly a comic book writer these days. I write books like uh, Harrow County, uh, Bone Parish, The Sixth Gun, uh, and Regression, uh, among many, many others. Most of which of my creator, most of my creator own stuff has a, a horror bend to it. Awesome. Uh, Rachel? Uh, I'm Rachel Autumn Deering. Um, I write mostly novels these days, but I started my career in comics many years ago. Um, I've written for DC Comics, Dark Horse, IDW, Image. I'm also an editor and a letterer, so kind of a gel of all trades in comics. Um, uh, but like I said, these days I mostly do prose novels. Awesome. Uh, and finally, Jamal. Oh, uh, yeah. My name is Jamal Eigel. I have been working in comics for 30 years. I've worked for pretty much every company at this point. So I've done stuff for Marvel, DC, Image, pretty much everybody. Um, Colin and I actually worked together yeah. on, a, on a story for Aftershock for their Shock Anthology. So, yeah, not too long ago. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And I guess when Tim gets here, then, uh, you know, he can fill us in on him, <laughs> on himself when he gets in. So I guess who wants to start? Like, who wants to share, like, I guess maybe their favorite horror comic that they've ever read? Like, why don't we start with that one? That, that's, I feel like that's a good place to start. Anybody want to jump in or should I just pick somebody? Uh, so pick somebody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll pick on Colin. There we go. Yeah, you know, it's it's tough. And and I have a stack of books here, by the way, that I brought. Same. These are great because I was I was kind of thinking yeah. we're gonna talk about horror comics. And there's some that I think are are must reads in horror comics. And I'm not gonna admit, you know, like Swamp Saga Swamp Thing, the, the Alan Moore Swamp Thing, uh, you know, Hellblazer, things like that. So I won't mention those. But to start, I can tell you about a comic that scared the living heck out of me um when I was a kid. Um and I have been trying to track this comic down for years and I can't find it. So when I was a kid, I used to really be into uh, the horror anthology books, uh, like uh, the Charlton stuff, like Ghosts, the DC stuff, like House of Mystery, all of those books. And there was one of those stories that I read that was about a little boy that lived on a farm and his grandfather was always smoking a pipe. And whenever his grandfather would fall asleep, the smoke of that pipe would billow out and turn into this monster and chase this boy all over the farm. 
And for whatever reason, that story scared me so badly as a kid. And I still credit that story to being why I never smoked in my life because I'm mm -hmm. afraid that a horrifying monster is going to come out of the cigarette or the pipe or whatever and chase me around <laughs> the farm. But since that time, and uh, you know, many, many years ago, I've lost, I don't know where that story was published. I may have dreamed it for all I know, because I've never been able to find it. And I've, I've searched and searched, but uh, that's the scariest uh, com horror comic I've ever read. It's, it has stuck with me for decades. Awesome. That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, how about you, Rachel? Um, there you go. Creepy number 63. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's got good stuff. a story in it. Yeah, a story in it called Jennifer, uh, written by Bruce Jones and illustrated by Bernie Wrightson. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, and it, I, I don't know. There's something so creepy about it. I won't ruin it because it's such a short, short story. You can't give too many details, but it's about a guy who comes across. Uh, a man in the forest getting ready to kill a little girl and he stops this guy from doing what he's gonna do and uh, it is maybe the worst decision this guy's ever made in his life so if you haven't read that one definitely uh, pick this up you can find these old creepy magazines in um, secondhand shops and in uh, used bookstores and stuff like that so definitely look yeah, that they're, up if you haven't read it yeah they're very good reads uh, how about you Maurice yeah, so uh, like Colin, I, I kind of grew up uh, reading uh, all, all those uh, DC uh, horror comics, uh, House of Secrets, Journey into Mystery, Witching Hour, Unexpected. I mean, th that was my go-to fun reading when, when I was a kid. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I will, however, uh, hone in on Alan Moore. Um, uh, Swamp Thing was uh, was uh, critical for me. Uh, uh, it hit me at just the right time. I was just coming. I was just thinking through what I want to do as as a writer, and then all of a sudden I get introduced to his uh, the uh, the American Gothic storyline uh, that we, which I still consider the seminal uh, Swamp Thing storyline, uh, which introduced us to characters like John Constantine and, and things like that. So um, so that that was actually one, one of a uh, one of the the key works for me. But actually, there were two other Alan Moore titles, too. Um, I love From Hell, um, his uh, exploration of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Jack the Ripper mythos. And then uh, and then a comic book that some people don't, I don't know if people would consider this a horror comic book. I always did. Um, his Miracle Man run. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 So I, I always consider that like a horror take on the Captain Marvel Shazam mythos. And I will never forget that. I, well, I can't remember the villain's name, but he had these like blue teeth. Um, they were like made of amethyst or something like that. It was just a crazy villain. Uh, but I mean, just that whole run on, on Miracle Man was just creepy greatness. Awesome. Another good pick. Okay, uh, you, Jamal. Okay, so like everybody else has said, you know, I cut my teeth on like the DC stuff. Um, Night Force was a big one for me for a very long time. Uh, Witching Hour, Swamp Thing. Uh, but... The one story, and I don't remember what issue it was, it was an issue of Creepy that I found. It was, it was always stuck with me. It was a story drawn by John Severin. And the it took place in the Old West. It was a, a bunch of like cavalry men and they were attacking an Indian village. And it was just so, like the way that he drew it was just so visual. Like he had them like cutting the scalps and everything. And it was just like, it, it's stuck with me like it visually stuck with me i think i saw this when i was like 12 and it's all i've never seen it again i've never seen that artwork again but it's always stuck with me visually and then another big thing that i'm into is i like offbeat vampire stories so two of my favorites right now are american vampire by uh scott snyder and Raphael albuquerque and then there's this a french series called rapaces which is uh, drawn by Marini, which is just absolutely gorgeous. So that's like, those are my big things. Awesome. I guess, I guess uh, to throw in, uh, I'd say one of my favorite things. Now, there's always been a uh, debate between if you count this as comics or not, but it, it's more manga, you would say, than anything. But uh, I like a lot of Junji Ito's work. Yes. Um, you know, some of them are goofy, like Uzumaki, and, you know, like, it's just like a town that gets fascinated with spirals and then, like, hair fights hair. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, then you had ones like Tomei. That was one of my favorites because it was just this idea of, like, this girl that keeps reincarnating herself. 
and is able to like you know make people do her bidding and stuff and i thought that was great and then like my favorite fa <clears throat> pardon me my favorite favorite short from him and it was probably one of his more tamer works was uh, i think it was like the incident at the aragon aragama uh, fault or something it was a uh, i can't remember the name of the fault but there was like an earthquake and like uh the ground shifted and there were holes that were shaped like human yeah. beings and mm -hmm. each hole was meant for a certain person and they called out to that person to go in and as you would travel it just like it would distort your body and stuff and like at the end you know i guess it was like a like a crew went around to try and figure out where the holes came out and they found it and it would twist the people like into these weird like pretzel shapes and everything it, it was it was so cool but it was like i i loved it because i read it when i was younger and it was just like because of it being tame but it also like made me think like wow you know like what would people do if something like that just came up out of nowhere you know like this unexplainable thing where there's just these holes and then they're like well you know there's one there for you should you go in or not and i, I just i always found that really fascinating plus his art is right. fantastic for the horror genre yeah yeah i actually have uzumaki here as one of my what, what i would say is one of the best top horror stories uh, and you're right. It's absolutely absurd. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, I think that's what he what makes uh, his stuff so great is so often it starts with these sort of absurd concepts, uh, a hole in the wall, you know, a hole in a mountainside that you're that's made for different people. Uh, right. But it takes it to this, these absolutely terrifying directions that uh, and I think it's always surprising. I think Uzumaki gives, goes into some bizarre, uh, bizarre places that are great. He does another book called Gaio, where the fish start coming up out of the sea, and they have. Oh legs. yeah, that's a. Yeah, and, that's a uh, fantastic yeah. story. Yeah, uh, it's a yeah. He's great. He is. He is. Um, I guess one of my other questions. Well, I guess well the next thing I was going to jump into since uh, Maurice brought up this uh, author. I mean, when we're talking about horror, you cannot talk about it without bringing up Alan Moore, which he has. Right. Um, I was just thinking Alan Moore and himself is a topic that could probably take us like a good, like 20 minutes to discuss of all the stuff he's done. But I, I wanted to jump into uh, basically when he started dabbling into the HP uh, Lovecraft area of horror, like, and I, I think like when he started that, that was with uh correct. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. It was uh, the gateway. Was that the one that started it? And then it went to like Neo Nomicon and then it went to Providence. That sounds right. Okay. But uh, I, I really enjoyed all of those. Like, I got Neonomicon back here on my uh, Mortal Kombat arcade machine. But uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Like, the art is really good in there. And I also like how just the way he tells the stories of, like, you know, the rituals and stuff that's going on. Like, he doesn't pull away from anything. He shows you everything. Right. You know, because like in the Onomicon, there's that whole scene of the woman that they lock away in the chamber with the uh, the the deep one, you know, and he just does what he wants with her. And in most comics, you wouldn't get away with that. You wouldn't even get that put on a shelf in a store anywhere, you know, but like he does it. And I I love it. And the writing is so spot on. And it, it I think he's one of the people who has captured like Lovecraft perfectly in comic form which a lot of people I don't think do because it's hard to do Lovecraft in a visual medium, but I think he pulls it off. Well, what do you guys think? Well, I think with Lovecraft, a lot of times people tend to lean more towards the, the monster side of it more often yeah. than the visual spectacle of that idea, as opposed to like the more, the, the, the darker horror element. I agree. I agree. Comics, comics is such a visual medium. It's hard to, you know, put down in images someone losing their mind. You know what I mean? Someone right, right. silently going going mad is not the most visually impactful story, but that's where the heart of Lovecraft is. So yeah, the the limited things that um, Alan Moore was able to do, you know, um, in that regard, I, I think he he pulled off well. Yeah, well, you can kind of yeah. I mean, you can you could kind of say uh, say. The same thing when you're trying to adapt like an Edgar Allan Poe story. You know, I'm, I can't can't even count how many adaptations of like Telltale Heart that I've seen done that never really really capture the the psychological toll 
you right. know, the, right. the desperation in the actual prose as opposed to trying to convey that in comics and, and you know even in film it is very difficult to really like get that idea across you know um right. I, th I think with horror especially just like it's the the anticipation that i think really drives people to horror more than anything else i think that's why it translates i think a little better to prose than it does to comics but comics does it equally as effective at, at times and then there's you know like with me you know as a, as primarily artists i mean i do some writing but as primarily an artist i'm always attracted to the visual first before right the, before the the written word and then i can dive into the written word afterwards so it's that you know but if i'm reading a story like i'm a big fan of caleb carr and when I'm reading a Caleb Carr story, the way he the way the way that he builds one of his novels, it's just so intriguing to me that you know I'm you know I'm sucked into that that the the the, the world building and the psychology behind it, right? Know? And that's hard to translate those ideas unless you're willing to take that deep dive. So when you're talking about someone like, like Alan Moore. Who is all about the deep dive? Like yes. <laughs> everything yeah. that Moore does is intricate and layered in a way that very few comics writers really are able to duplicate. Not that they don't try; they not that they try and they do it to varying successes. But just like having had the opportunity to read an Alan Moore script. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just there's a lot. There's there's a lot there that goes un, unseen by the average person. So I feel like you know, with with prose and horror, there's always that idea, you know, the the deeper layers and meaning that don't really translate as well when you're trying to adapt it to a visual medium. Well said, man. <laughs> so well said. <laughs> You took the fumbling words right out of my mouth and said it clearly for everybody to hear. <laughs> I, I, don't oh. love, I love I love comics as a as a medium for delivering horror because you you obviously have the visual element and it's easier to show someone something scary than to describe something scary because mm -hmm. when pe when people read words on a on a page their mind is going to dream up their own version of it but if you show them exactly what you mean you know exactly what you have in mind i think that there's a big impact there if your artist pulls it off well and mm -hmm. then there's the power of the page turn you are putting the scare in the hands of the reader when you're talking about comics because it's it's their job to turn that page right to to give the killer power or the monster power you know what i mean they're the one turning the page they're the one progressing the story and when you turn the page to a, a brilliant splash page of some kind of carnage you know what i mean that's I think that the payoff there is is great. Uh, and as someone who's written both comics and prose in the horror genre, I found it easier to scare people in comics than mm. I do in, in prose, yeah. actually. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'd like, you know, with comics versus, like, horror as a medium is that, like, with comics, you have a wide variety of art and artists that can mm -hmm. portray the story you're telling different than just a CGI crank-it-out factory Right. That would make a version of a monster put it on screen and everyone's just like, yeah, that's not what I think it should look like. You know, I mean, like you can have that with comics, but like art is so key. And there are so many great artists in comic books right now that, yeah, horror is perfect for that genre. I, I, I will fully believe comic book horror should like never die. Oh, no, I absolutely agree. There, there's, you know, but I don't think any genre should be left unexplored when it comes to comics anyway so right i agree i agree yeah, um, and, I, you know, and it's it's interesting because you know yeah you know so many people think of comics as you know superheroes and that's what you think you know that's that's the first thing that pops into your head when you think of comics yeah mm -hmm. i love i love superheroes too but man there are some just there are just so many great horror comics and and i was just it just popped into my head and i'm surprised i didn't mention it as maybe my favorite horror comic uh uh, New Mutants number 18, when that came out, 
you know, here was a book that's essentially a young X-Men title. Right. And then New Mutants number 18 came out uh, with the Bill Sienkiewicz art. And it changed everything I knew about comics in, in just a matter of 20 pages. Everything I had ever thought I understood about comic books and superhero comics was completely changed. Um, yeah. And it, it may, I mean, that, and I, I always think of it as a superhero comic, but that's a horror comic through and through. Mm -hmm. that, those three issues, especially the first, the 18, 19, and 20, those issues are some of the best horror comics you'll ever read. I mean, right. it's, it's shockingly terrifying, uh, especially 18, the first few pages of it. I agree. Good stuff. Cool. So I had, I, I know we're going to get some questions in here from the uh, chat pretty soon, but I had one question I wanted to ask all you guys. Now, we know that there is a plethora of really great horror comics out there, but what are some of your guilty pleasure horror comics? Like the ones that, you know, you'd look on your shelf and be like, I own that, but I kind of don't know why I own it. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't we start with uh, what's it? I, I, I'm going to go in a reverse order let's start with uh, I usually start with Maria so I'll start with Jamal this time Ooh, okay my guilt I don't own a copy of it anymore because I have a 12 year old who reads comics and I don't want it to be lying around for her to find <laughs> but Faust Faust was my jam for a very long time it definitely was my guilty pleasure, but I was like really into that style of like black and white horror at that point. Like mm -hmm. this is like high, like I was 17, 18, high school. Like so I was reading Faust and Brat Pack and just like all this like, uh. so yeah, so that that's, there's my answer. It's Faust. <laughs> what about you, Rachel? Uh, I guess it's more of a, a publisher than one comic itself because it's another horror anthology series. But uh, Nightmare, Psycho, and Scream from uh, Skywald Publishing—they're uh, just—they're horrible books, truly. The 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 story, <laughs> um, but the artwork is fantastic because the the editor of the, the editor in chief of that publishing company was this short guy who apparently carried a snub nosed pistol around the office you know while these people were writing and, and drawing stories and he would kind of intimidate people uh into keeping working for him because they didn't pay very well and he was hiring a lot of artists from europe and other countries where comics weren't as big and he was getting them for cheap so the stories were horrible but the art was fantastic and this guy this sort of unscrupulous editor running around with a, a pistol threatening the people who worked for him i love everything about that and i just love how <laughs> these comics are you just imagine that, like you're not getting paid good at all, and then you got this guy with a pistol just walking around, like keep working, keep drawing, keep writing. I, shockingly, I think we can all imagine it very clearly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, how about you, Colin? Well, first of all, I don't think there's a, such a thing as a guilty pleasure. Thank you. I, I think if, if, if you you know let people like things and don't take any, don't feel guilty about the things you like. And as I'm sitting, because I, as I start sitting here thinking about it, I'm like, what am I, what am I ashamed that I like? <laughs> I don't know that there's anything. <laughs> um, uh, there, you know, there's a magazine called 1984 that I remember reading when I was a kid that was probably too adult for me. And I still love that magazine. Um, mm -hmm. And they made, th and there's another, there was a series of magazines and Rachel, they may have been published by the same publisher. Uh, there was like Nightmare, uh, Nightmare Vampire Tales and Tales of the Witches and the covers were so ridiculously lurid. The vampires always had giant fangs that were just dripping, you know, caked on blood, just dripping off of them. And uh, they were very colorful and bright. And I love those magazines. I, I'm ashamed I can't name one. I probably have several of them over here on my magazine rack, but I can't see them. Those were eerie publications. The, were those the eerie? Was called okay, eerie. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but they, I mean, they were, they were, probably magazines that parents didn't want their kids buying when they were, you know, when they were coming out, but I still like them. <laughs> awesome. Maurice? I'm trying to think if I have any actual guilty pleasure, because uh, <laughs> uh, again, I'm just guilt-free, I guess. I mean, <laughs> don't get me wrong, you know, when I was doing my research for a story not too long ago and I had all these issues of Vampirella laying around, I was like, okay, maybe I shouldn't have these around if the boys are running around the house. Um, 
or, uh, I, but you know, actually for me, it was, uh, again, I don't even consider it a guilty pleasure. I, I love 30 Days of Night. Uh, that was like my, and I think the guilt for me is in the whole vampire thing, because I'm always, oh, I'm just over vampire stories. And then I like go to like 30 Days of Night and go, I'm not as over it as I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I When I thought of this question, I had a couple in my mind. Uh, one of the first ones was, uh, now I'm a big video game person. You can probably tell by my background alone. But um, there was a line of comics that they wrote for Silent Hill. I don't know if you guys saw these or anything, but uh, they, they, they kind of missed the whole point of Silent Hill. <laughs> it was like a it was like a thing where they put like more characters in the actual town that would never really be there to begin with, and right. it just like, the, it missed the tone completely for me. But I can't. I, I revisit them all the time just because <laughs> I love Silent Hill so much that I'm just I like I have to have these things even if like. If I put them alphabetically, I'm like, wow, it's really tarnishing the left and the right side of where they take up on the shelf. Um, another one for me, I got it right here. I don't know if you guys read this one or not. Love that. I love it. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. I, I, I love this, but I, I also know how goofy it is <laughs> because of just like the idea of Batman himself fighting Dracula, getting poisoned, you know, and then him getting like powers and stuff. From, it, it's just so awesome. And it should fit, but it's just like some of the dialogue is so goofy. <laughs> and I love, I, I love it for that. I love that era of comics and even the era preceding that. Like, I was telling someone the other day that my favorite superhero comic is Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you had, mm -hmm. you had issues where Lois was going to marry Satan and, you know, she was turned into a demon and Superman had to save her. And then uh, this she really became a black woman for 24 hours. Right, the really <laughs> politically incorrect <laughs> uh, issue, like three issues later, where she became a black woman, and, and the cover is like, "No, I have to become a black woman for 24 hours." And it's like, "What the?" Fuck? <laughs> I love that era. That goofy. I have to. <laughs> it's what it says. The story, I love that, yeah. I that Gonzo era. The story itself isn't. It sounds worse than it actually is, but the story the story itself is is actually like they actually deal with real racial issues in the story. It was, it was kind of progressive considering the time period. Mm -hmm. So, But boiling that down to a cover and three word balloons is never easier. Yeah. Right? No, right. not at all. <laughs> um, another one I was going to throw out was when uh, the hype for uh, Freddy versus Jason hit and then everybody was wondering where it was going to go next and then we got Freddy versus Jason versus Ash. Yeah. I think, I think that was like a six part series, I think. It was like was a six, six issue mini, I think, or maybe it was three. I don't know, but I think there was more than one issue of it. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I, I remember. I, I, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Matt. No, no, go ahead, man. No, I was just going to say that I have my problems with anything like ancillary to Nightmare on Elm Street, just because they always seem wildly off the mark, like just completely mm -hmm. missed the point of the original movie. So. You know, that's just no, I, that's I, just my thing. I agree with you on that. I, I like that you have a Nightmare on Elm Street soapbox that you're getting on right now. <laughs> <laughs> I could get I could get started, but we don't have that kind of time. Look, I watched oh, Nightmare I, on Elm Street. I want to break in and say I got Jamal's back on this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <There we go. laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, so I mean I I remember picking them up because I was so fascinated to read them. And I was I was hyped when the movie came out because I was like, you know, it's my two favorite slashes of all time finally facing off for what turned out to be like five minutes. But, mm -hmm. you know, then they're like, oh, we're throwing Ash in the mix. And I was like, everybody wanted Michael Myers, obviously, but, you know, right. rights issues and stuff. But diving into those comics, it was even the first one. I'm just like, oh, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like that series because I felt I was the same as you, Matt. I, I was so excited for that series. I really liked the Freddy versus Jason movie. Again, mm -hmm. I don't have guilt. Um, <laughs> and uh, I feel like that comic, it was so important to capture the voices of the actor, you know, especially the Robert England and Bruce Campbell. And I think that was hard for them to do in that comic, uh, it, you know, without them on the screen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and mm -hmm. it just didn't it never rang true to me. Yeah. Uh, and do, doing right. licensed properties like that in comics form is difficult, too, as someone who has written for, like, uh, Cartoon Network 
and right. um, Blizzard Entertainment and stuff like that, because the editors often have no, not seen the source material, you know what I mean? And the people who own the source material have never read a comic. They don't give a shit about comics. They just want the money. And then the writer may or may not have a love for the source material. You know, they're a hired gun kind of. So it's hard to do uh, a licensed material, intellectual property like that in comics form and make it true to the original. If you find a really good comics adaptation of something, it's, it's rare. That said, right. if they do a Freddy versus Jason versus Ash versus Michael Myers comic, I'm first in line to buy it tomorrow. <laughs> That's out, I, I probably will be too, Cole. Yeah. <laughs> my, my head might be lowered and I'll be staring at my money wondering if it's worth more than this, but I'll probably buy it too. <laughs> All right, we got a, we got a question popping in here. It's from Otter Poet. He says, does the visual medium hinder the horror of ambiguity and existentialism of modern cosmic horror? Or are the instances where, or are there instances where it works? So anybody I, that wants to jump in, I, I think ultimately it depends on the artists. I mean, you know, I, I think I, I think that there are people who, you know, we've talked about Wrighton, we've talked about Sienkiewicz. I mean, those guys are were built for horror, like. And I'm not just talking about their their storytelling abilities, but their ability to convey shadow and to obscure things, but not take away from the the, the darkest elements of that. You know, right. I would even say the same thing about Kevin O'Neill. You know, if you if you look at like Legion of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen or Martial Law. Like that, like there's those elements in there as well. So I think there are artists who are really made for that genre. Yeah, uh, Francesco Francavilla is also another one. Robert Hack is really good. Greg Smallwood is really good at horror as well. So, no, I agree. Yeah. I mean, and especially with cosmic horror, I, I was thinking there. Uh, I think somebody brought it up in chat earlier. Um, and you were mentioning artists, like without the art, I think this story, you wouldn't be able to even follow it at all. And that's nameless, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, cause it jumps all over the place. You're, you're, you know, sometimes you're way, way back in the past and then you're in modern day and then you're like five years ago. Then you're like, sometimes there's like a future, right? Uh, like scene. And you're just without the way that art was done, you wouldn't, you know, if you wrote that in a novel, I don't think people would be able to follow it, you know? So yeah, the art is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, it all depends on, um, you know, uh, someone said earlier, when you think of Lovecraftian and cosmic horror, a lot of people immediately gravitate to, oh, it's Cthulhu. And we got to have, right. Cthulhu, you know, and, and, right. that's, and a lot of people, that's what they want. And, and honestly, the, you know, there's probably a lot of creators, uh, writers and artists, that that's how they view it, too. And so you've got to get the, you know, to get a true, uh, that true feeling of, of, of dread and hopelessness and worthlessness that you get with real cosmic horror. It, 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 it takes a creative team. Everybody really has to understand it and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and embrace it. I have nothing against Cthulhu rampaging through a city and fighting Godzilla or whatever. That's awesome too. Right. But, but that's not the point of Cthulhu though. That's not cosmic horror. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, but it would be a guilty pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, see, I, I tend to be quiet on on these topics, mostly because of my complicated relationship with all things Lovecraft. So, <laughs> so I, I have to sort of begin there, mm -hmm. and so I'm kind of listening to the air uh, the air of uh, all right. So, would how would uh, what would be some of the ways I, I what what would be some of the books that I could look at where I could get Lovecraft snuck in with me? Um, you know, cause I have this huge Lovecraft. You know, uh, I just can't right. do it all the time. Uh, but I mean. But I am a fan of uh, Hellboy, and I'm, so I, this is what I'm thinking through while, I'm, while we're having this conversation. It's like, well, I do like Mike Manola, and and, and the, when he, whenever he engages the mythos, so I'm, it's one of those things where I'm in this strange headspace of. Uh, well, uh, I, my question about Hellboy, because Hellboy kind of straddles the the horror superhero right. line, and I, for me personally, I think Hellboy leans more towards the superhero than the the horror. Although Mike does horror very well. You know, but that's just my personal thing, you know. And then, you know, I got a, my wife's huge Hellboy collection. And <laughs> so, 
Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of Hellboy in my house. <laughs> if uh, if you want a good example of the more human existential horror done well, there's an issue of creepy to always go back to creepy. Um, that Bernie Wrightson drew. Um, an adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat. Mm -hmm. And that story just follows one guy losing his mind after he kills his wife, you know, and, and this cat that's terrorizing him. So there's no real monster in it. There's no visual uh, gimmick to rely on. It's just one man going insane. But it's really, really beautiful because Bernie is able to capture human emotion so well. So that's probably my, the best example of an existential horror comic that I can think of. Awesome. Um, I guess do I have to ask the man behind the curtain to put up another question? Or <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, now that the question's gone, there we go. Victoria, uh, she asks, "What modern horror comics, if any, do you read and recommend?" Um, I, I think we talked about a couple. Um, I mean, I guess I kind of. I kind of consider Providence to be still pretty modern. I think that was like, what was that? Like five years ago that concluded something like that. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Providence is a I pretty got, good one to I pick got, up on. I've Go got ahead. Two actually. I've been enjoying um, basket, the basket full of heads and uh, the plunge over the DC, the, the Joe Hill books. Both of them are mm -hmm. actually really, really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I like severed a lot uh from scott snyder um severed was fantastic and there's this book uh some of you may have read called harrow county mm -hmm. this guy um <laughs> caller colin I don't know, colin Bunry. it's good very good gorgeous artwork i hate that one i like that one too it's my favorite <laughs> no i uh I'll, you know i'll double down on severed's great uh the plot um by uh, mike morrissey's great um, and this isn't modern. It's not, well, it's modern-ish, but I did pull it out because a lot of people have never heard of this. Have you guys heard of the Upturned Stone? No, never. I have not. All right. So this is a novella. It's fully painted. It's gorgeous. It's by Scott Hampton. Mm. It's like a 50-page novella. It's about some kids who on Halloween pick a giant pumpkin out of a cemetery, and then their mom makes it into a pumpkin pie and they eat it and they start experiencing these ghostly hallucinations. But it's also about growing up and, uh, and you know, uh, about, uh, about losing your, you know, losing your youth and your innocence. But uh, the reason I mention it, it came out, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. You can still get it, I think, on heavymetal.com for like in hardcover for a few bucks, super mm. cheap. And it yeah. is, I mean, it's an amazing little horror novella you guys got to check out. That that whole awesome. description checks off every box for me. Like, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> what about you, Maurice? You reading anything modern? Recommend so anything? Here, here's my problem. Uh, so when, so I my old my young my oldest son is 19 years old. So 19 years ago, I quit collecting comic books because it's an expensive hobby, <laughs> um, and I'm sitting in a room surrounded my my by my collection, which is like I've over 20,000 books around me right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I was pretty good with like, all right, I'm good. I don't need to buy anymore. You know, I'm, I'm solid. And then my friends start writing comic books. And <laughs> like, I'm, I, it's like I'm slowly being drawn back in. So like, you know, Cullen freaking, I end up buying the hardcover of The Tooth. I'm like, I'm like, why? Why, Cullen? Why are you doing this to me? Um, and, and so I'm slowly starting to get back into comics. So I'm actually listening to this portion of the conversation going, all right, I know I have no business buying any more books. However, what, what sort of exceptions can I start making? So y'all keep going. I'm good. <laughs> um, I, I was going to throw another one in. I read, um, I think this was also a couple years ago. It was a uh, house of penance. It was about uh, the Winchester oh, yeah. mansion. Yeah. By uh, Pete that, Tomasi. Yeah. Yes. That's yep. Yes. Thank you for that. Cause I am terrible with names. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, we got another question here from Michael. He asks, uh, any licensed comics you think did well? Uh, have you guys read the Pumpkinhead so. adaptation? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. You know, you know what? Um, Action Lab actually did a... Uh, oh, God. Full Moon. They had the, they had the, uh, the Full Moon properties for a while. So they, they did... Uh, uh, Puppet Master? 
Yes, they did puppet mask. They did puppet they did mask. They did subspecies. <laughs> right. <laughs> Long live Radu. <laughs> So they, that that was actually, I mean, you know, Puppet Master is not my my go to when it comes to Full Moon. I was more of like a doll man kind of uh, kind of guy, but you know, but they did it well. Okay, yeah, I was a fan of those Full Moon adaptations, and and yes, the the subspecies one I wrote, but uh, the uh, I was I was actually pitching a demonic toys one. We had one in the works for Demonic Toys until, uh, you know, there was a lot of changes in uh, editorial and publisher there. Yeah. Uh, and yes, that Pumpkinhead comic is awesome, too. It's great. <laughs> I'm just feeding money into your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Pumpkinhead's one that uh, I didn't know was getting adapted. I was at San Diego Comic-Con and I saw a news item come up that, they were, that there was going to be a Pumpkinhead comic. So I emailed the editor as I was walking to the convention hall and said, you can't hire anyone besides me to write this comic. So <laughs> it's amazing how often that works. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm trying to think of like other licensed ones that did well. Oh, well, I don't have to, there's another question. <laughs> so here we go. Another question. Did anyone ever read uh, John Ostrander's wasteland from DC in the late eighties? I knew about it, but I don't remember reading it. Yeah, yeah, someone I can't asked say me either. about Wasteland not long ago, too, and I, it feels like I should have been reading or I probably would have been reading it, but I don't think so. But it I comes up a lot. Either. Yeah, it comes up a lot in these horror, horror comic panels. I guess I should Sorry, write none it. none of us read it, huh? I feel bad now. Sorry. <laughs> <sighs> okay. So here, Alpha Guy asks, at Colin Bunn, I think it was you. Please repeat the name of the oh. pumpkin novella. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, The Upturned Stone by uh, Scott oh. Hampton. And Heavy Metal Books published it, and it at least recently was still on their website. Awesome. Okay, so we got one from Mike Duke here at Maurice. Uh, if oh, you don't no. mind, uh, <laughs> digital... <laughs> If you don't mind digital, go with the Comixology app and you can read on the down low without adding physical books to your collection. <laughs> See, I love the enablers in my life. I'm like, oh, so perfect. Like, okay, noted. <laughs> okay, again from Otter Poet. Uh, does anyone on the panel remember or have any of the Clive Barker comics from when he created superheroes for Marvel? I think oh, absolutely. it was Marvel. Yeah. yeah. Hokum and Hex. Hokum and Hex. Yeah. I really that always jumps to top of mind is Hokum and Hex. But uh, well, the, Ec the Ecto Kid was the yeah, other one. The other one? Was part yeah. Of yeah. <laughs> yep. Had all those. Yeah, I Ecto still have them somewhere awesome. in a the box. They were probably uh, not not my favorite Clive Barker stuff, but it was good for a horror author going out and making superhero books. Yeah, it was about as good as you could hope for it to be. Oh no, absolutely! And then there was the ab the of course the adaptation of Nightbreed, mm -hmm. which yeah. Yeah. I actually and, uh, I actually enjoyed the the Nightbreed comics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've the Great and Secret Shadow. Yeah, uh, I get all I get a lot of my old comics bound into hardcover, and I've been collecting mm -hmm. those uh, Nightbreed comics to have them bound up for me. Oh, okay. That's right. <laughs> I just have to ask because this was probably around the time when I, w I was just reading superhero comics, but for the Clive Barker ones, did they put that little tag in there about like, I've seen the future of horror and his name is Clive Barker? Did they put that on every cover? I'm on the head. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't think you can have an IP with him without having that one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next question. Eric Williams asks, are there any horror comic characters slash franchises that you would love to be involved in bringing back, rebooting, or reimagining? I've already done it, so I was. You know, oh, lucky I you! Reading, I know. I grew up reading, and, and the only reason I say that is not to brag, but it's because I've done the exact thing I, I started out to do. So I, the the way I got into comics was my uncle gave me a stack of old horror magazines, um, creepy, eerie, Vampirella, and some Savage Sword of Conan and stuff like that, and told me, you know, don't tell anyone I gave you these. So it instantly made them more awesome to me and the most important one was creepy creepy number one uh was 
my gateway drug to reading, not only just to, to making comics, but to reading in general. And um, Creepy went away in 1983, which is the year I was born. Um, and, you know, after, after I found that out, I'm like, well, there's no sense in continuing to read comics. The best one is done. But in 2009, Dark Horse brought back uh, Creepy, and I was able to write for two issues of that. So that was dream come true for me. Um, so I'm exempt from this question, but I answered anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think for me, it would come down to two different things. So uh, either, you know, me being able to do any of those, like I said, that the, the comics I grew up with, with like the House of Secrets and Journey to Mystery, if you could give me like Cain and Abel again, uh, I, I would love to do something with them or, uh, or, or the Spectre actually. Uh, you know, there's a uh, incarnation of God's justice. I mean, if if I'm if you handed me that character in the era of the Black Lives Matter uh, time, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something with that character. So that, that'd probably be my my uh, my thing. That sounds yeah, really I interesting. Like, I feel like I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to to mark so many you know characters off my bucket list of characters I've wanted to to do something with, but there's still so many and it's, and, and all of the characters that I really want to do something with are either the DC horror line or the Marvel horror line. You know, uh, I've gotten really close with Swamp Thing like a couple of times. And, and <laughs> comics. It's amazing that any comic ever comes out the way things always seem to change and move and fall apart. Uh, but Swamp Thing, uh, Etrigan the Demon, uh, man thing at Marvel, Dr. Druid. There's just so many of those that I would, you know, uh, I have folders and folders of ideas for those characters. I, th I think awesome. along the same line, if I could do something with the Night Stalkers, the original Night Stalkers, that would be cool. Either that or Werewolf by Night, I think might be fun. Jamal, let's put a pitch together. And right now, <laughs> I think Jamal and I could really do a great comic. <laughs> we have similar tastes, obviously. Um, so here we got one from Christy Hill. Uh, who's a new voice in horror writing that needs to be more known? Oof. Other than Matt Wilderson. <laughs> Matt Wilderson. <laughs> yeah. you, you took my answer. <laughs> no, no, I didn't call. <laughs> there, there are uh, not a ton of new people writing horror comics these days that I can think of personally. No, unfortunately not. Uh, or horror comics in general. Horror comics, like back when I was working on comics full time, I put together this book that Colin is in, uh, actually called In the Dark. Huge 400 page hardcover um, book. And all the publishers told me horror doesn't sell, horror comics don't sell, and anthologies don't sell. Yeah. And it's coming over to prose, I've heard the same exact thing. But, um, you know, there's just not a ton of new people writing horror comics. Um, so it's hard to, hard to make a recommendation there. Right. I wanted to throw this in, in the previous question about anything that you'd like to work on. I personally would always like to get in and write another serious story for the crow. Because I feel like that's something that's been kind of left in the back for a while. And it hasn't been taken seriously because of the movies that have, <laughs> like, uh, part two through four, for example. I don't know. <laughs> I, I always wanted to write one where he came back, but during the transition, he ended up having amnesia. So he has to piece together why he's back and what he needs to do before his powers run out. It was just an idea I kind of had. I, I saw a meme recently. It's awful. Somebody said the crow is basically RoboCop for goths. <laughs> <laughs> well, that ruined that for me now. <laughs> That's a guilty pleasure now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Dan, we're coming to the bar. And we're ending on that note. <laughs> I take it back about wanting to work with you, Jamal. Oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Jamal, I gotta, I gotta tell you this: the comments, uh, you know, people are watching this in two places. They're watching on the Scares the Care Weekend website and on the YouTube feed. The comments on the YouTube feed, overwhelmingly, uh, if we do a physical convention next year, I'm going to extend the invite right now. We will fly you in. We will put you up in the hotel, but you have to agree to do a talk on Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> People are here for that. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you better book me like three hours because I'm going to go deep. <laughs> I would love to also sit in on that panel. <laughs> that would be fantastic. I, I want to remind folks, uh, we've got some of the cast from Nightmare on Elm Street 2, 3, and 4 coming up uh, later this afternoon here in the stream. Uh, but right now, big round of applause and thank you from everybody on the charity and this year's host families to Maurice Broaddus, Colin Bunn, Matt Wilderson, Jamal Eigel, and Rachel Autumn Deering. Love you all. Seriously, I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. All right.